they say a picture can be worth a thousand words. But in some cases, you need to spend a thousand words just to explain what it is that you're looking at. Hello and welcome back. Today I want to share my first attempts at doing radio astronomy related activities, how I went about it and what I found out about radio in the process. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Now the simple way of explaining what radio astronomy is about is to say it's a way of looking at celestial objects using a radio. Now if you want to be really technical, you can always say that classical or optical astronomy, just like radio astronomy, also relies on the electromagnetic waves that reach the Earth. However, the radio in radio astronomy typically refers to frequencies below 300 GHz. Now, for the average amateur, you will not get anywhere near this. However, there are a few targets of interest which can still be observed using relatively modest setups. On the higher end, you have the hydrogen line at around 1.42 GHz. Observations in this area will focus on large gas clouds and observing the frequency shift will highlight the relative movement in reference to the Earth. Then in the relatively low tens of megahertz range, you can observe Jupiter and its interactions with its closest moon Io. But what my research showed to be the easiest thing to pick up is the closest star to us, the Sun. While gas clouds and Jupiter pose a challenge in observing, even in optical astronomy, it can be pretty hard to miss the Sun. It's the really big orange thing located in the sky. Never look at it directly without appropriate protection though. So that was my target. Make a setup that can observe radio emissions coming from the sun. How hard can it be? Well, the next thing to look at is what exactly can you even see? What would the radio emissions look like? It's not like the sun is going to call CQ or anything. Now, going over the solar radio emissions page on Wikipedia, we'll give some interesting hints. The sun emits over multiple frequency ranges. You can, I mean the professionals can, perform mapping scans in the tens of gigahertz down into the few megahertz. There are multiple types of solar bursts which can be observed in a wide frequency spectrum. And these look quite interesting. So there is a significant amount of phenomena to be observed regarding the sun. To make expectations a bit more realistic though, I decided to observe something in the lower frequency spectrum. These things seem to appear at quite low frequency. So this should be doable. So now that I had a clear target, the next phase was to create some sort of observation setup. I knew it was going to be some sort of SDR, software defined radio related receiver. But the next important piece of the puzzle was the recording, processing and viewing software. This led me to quite an interesting resource. So this is the Radio Jovi project, an initiative done with the support of NASA, which is a citizen science and educational outreach project intended to help you take the first steps into radio observations of the Sun and Jupiter using modest setups. It's quite an interesting website with a lot of interesting resources. But the thing that I mainly used was the Radio Sky Spectrograph software, of which you have a few snippets already shown on the front page. So these are the sorts of observations done with the kinds of setups that an amateur could create without too much investment. These are some examples of solar bursts. And indeed, these look awesome. So under Radio Telescope software, you have a link to this program. So here you will find the download link, as well as a help file that explains how it works and what else you need to get it connected to an SDR. I will not be going into the details today, but this is a very well explained resource you shouldn't have any issues with. Now, I do have a collection of multiple SDRs, some being considered better than others, but the thing that seemed most important for this particular experiment was the maximum frequency span. Of the three devices I have, the HackRF stands out since it can cover 20 MHz of bandwidth in a single scan. So this is what I used. This was interfaced using the SDR Sharp program and using an add-on, the Ellen Duffy SDR Sharp Radio Spectrograph plugin, you connect the software to the spectrograph recorder. 
and after a bit of fiddling and settings, it works. Then in the spectrograph, you can set timed recordings. I found that 24 hour recordings are the best to keep file sizes manageable. These will still be almost one gigabyte each, but that's not really an issue nowadays. And then you just let the setup to run and run and come back later to see what happened. Before looking at some of the results, let me finish explaining what the rest of the measurement setup contained. Other than the receiver, you also need an antenna, and some other things can be helpful as well. So the setup was built around the loop antenna, roughly 70 centimeters in diameter, then the body of the antenna consists in a balen, a filter, and an amplifier, so this is nothing special, just some basic components, and the amplifier bit is the one I covered in an older video. Then at the other end of the cable, I had the bias T that supplied the antenna and an extra low pass filter. The idea with all the filters was to eliminate the commercial FM bands or other high frequency noise that could cause issues by overdriving the receiver. The whole setup was placed in an old building I had access to and left to run for a few days at a time, once every month. So the whole experiment covered about half a year. The last thing to clarify is the exact frequency range that was recorded. After the initial tests I carried out to see what the setup can actually pick up, I settled into the 0 to 20 MHz range. Not because it contained a bunch of solar emissions, but because I could at least pick up something. Let's say equally, if not even more interesting. Now, if you study to get a ham license, or just out of curiosity, one of the things you will learn about is how the Earth's atmosphere, in particular the ionosphere, interacts with radio waves. So there are three main layers of interest, the D and E layer, mainly present during the day, and the F layer, present during the day and the night, which splits into two layers during the day. In a simplified way, we can say that the layers present during the day absorb lower frequency signals, but still reflect high frequency ones, and during the night the situation changes, and lower frequency waves can travel over long distances, but not the high frequency ones. Because of this, sky wave propagation allows communications over very long distances, but the quality of the link is frequency and time of day dependent. Anyway, that's what the theory says. Now, you can of course verify this by going over the shortwave bands at different times of day and observing that signals do not appear constantly throughout the day. Sometimes you observe signals, sometimes you don't. But unless you do this continuously for 24 hours and keep a meticulous record, you will never be sure of when each signal is actually at its peak. So anyway, once the setup was set up and left to record for a while, what did it pick up? What do the recordings tell us? So first of all, the scales. The y-axis is frequency, 0 to 20 MHz, and the x-axis is UTC time, starting from 00, 0 up to 24. Local time is UTC plus 3. So for the purpose of evaluating what the best time is to listen to a station or another, we should keep this time shift in mind. Now, the graph contains signal intensity at each frequency and time point, so black is zero, and in this particular case, yellowish orange is the strongest signal. This, of course, can be adjusted from the spectrogram program. Now, most of these traces are actual radio signals, but you also have various noises that the reception setup creates. So, whenever there is a line spanning the entire scan, that has the exact same intensity throughout the 24 hour period, it's safe to assume it's not really a radio source. In contrast, whenever signals appear and disappear, and their intensity changes, then it's far more likely to be a real signal. Especially if the intensity constantly varies, then it's highly likely it's not a direct signal, like we see in the AM band, but rather it's a signal that goes through skywave propagation and fades based on the exact status of the ionosphere. And even without going into any details, we can already say that the amount of radio signals and their distribution in the spectrum is clearly time of day dependent. During the night, with a maximum at around 1 am local time, we see the lowest frequencies appearing, 
and during the day, at around 3 pm, we see the highest ones. So the spectrum is not centered around 12 am and 12 pm, but rather there is a slight shift appearing. Another interesting thing to observe is that while you do have symmetry, in the sense that you are transitioning from low to high frequencies and then back throughout the day, the exact amount of radio traffic is different in the morning compared to the evening. Now, you may think that there was more activity in this specific day in the second half, but the exact same pattern was visible every single time. So here I have sets of five consecutive days, each recorded in a different month, and it always looks more or less the same. The reason for this behavior is the position of the sun and where the absorbing and reflecting layers are located in the atmosphere. As previously discussed, two extremes are during midday and midnight, when the highest and lowest concentration of charged particles are directly above the receiver, but two more important times of the day are morning and evening, when these extremes are located to the sides. In the morning, the sun rises in the east, so whatever RF activity is going on there is absorbed by the D layer, but whatever is going on in the west is free to be received, and in contrast, in the evening, as the sun moves to the west, this is where most absorption takes place, so you're more likely to receive signals from the east. So the recording is telling me that from my location in Eastern Europe, there are more strong signals in the east compared to the west. Not necessarily radio amateurs, these really strong ones are usually commercial radio stations, but anyway, this is still an interesting observation. Also explains why most of the languages that I hear, I can't really understand. Now, the recordings are very cyclical. Here we see two consecutive days, showing very similar patterns. Now, the patterns themselves are not perfectly identical, but they do follow more or less the same frequency distribution. You can take one such observation and rely on it as a general rule to predict what certain frequencies will be more active during coming days and weeks. But another pattern that I noticed was the intensity changing over time. So most of these graphs are generated using the same settings, I hope at least, but as time passes, the general brightness or signal intensity decreases. I observe the strongest signals appearing in late spring and then the weakest ones during winter. This should follow a 12 month cycle, but I just couldn't keep the setup running that long. Of course, if you have the time and energy, you could potentially run such a measurement for a few decades and also highlight the solar 11 year cycle. But that's something for another video. So you can figure out quite a lot about the general usage of the shortwaves using such a setup. But can you actually get any radio astronomy observations done? Well, this brings a very important topic into discussion. How can you even confirm if your recording is showing an astronomical phenomenon or if it's just picking up some local noise? This brings us to one of the most interesting resources I came across. So this is the website of the Nancy Radio Observatory in France. It's quite an impressive site with multiple instruments and it's capable of recording signals from a few megahertz up into the gigahertz range. But the really interesting thing about them is that they make public their recording data. So I guess there's more to it than this, but the thing that I found most interesting is the results of the DAM, the decametric array. So here under Bilan observations, we get this new window appearing in which we can select if we want to see observations of the sun or Jupiter in black and white or color and on the various days that the observations were made. So we get this sort of a plot with the spectrograph recording. And of course, all of this data is publicly available and it's not just for the last few days, but rather it spans for the past almost 35 years. So as long as you're located in Europe and you're unsure of the observations that you've carried out, you can always compare that to what the professionals have recorded. There are similar observatories in other parts of the world with public databases, 
but this one was most interesting to me since this is something that I can use to compare my data. Not much to say other than this is a really great resource. So one of the first observations I had looks something like this. Apart from the general pattern of signals appearing based on the time of day and frequency, I also had all sorts of noise and interruptions appearing. At the time of the observation, I honestly thought that something was broken. Maybe a loose solder joint or something, which led to a bunch of resoldering and wire checking. I mean, you're not supposed to have these cuts and these interruptions, right? Now, if you compare the recording to what the NDA observed on the same day, well, you get a very clear cut in their measurements as well. And it's occurring at exactly the same time, around 1 p.m. UTC. Both observations show the same general behavior, so this isn't really a mistake, but rather a genuine phenomenon. Turns out that on the 14th of May, at around 1 o'clock UTC, there was a quite strong X-class solar flare emitted, which had the effect of over-ionizing the atmosphere and cutting out radio reflections. And there was an even stronger one appearing at about 5 o'clock, which also appears in my spectrum recording. I guess that since it was already 8 o'clock locally, the effect was weaker since my location was facing away from the sun at this point, but still it's interesting to have a confirmation that these anomalies are real and not some setup related issue. This also means that most likely everything else is also real. In the end, I personally found these experiments quite interesting. And even if I did not reach my goal of making direct observations of the sun, I did still succeed in making indirect observations. The ionosphere, while part of the Earth, is still highly impacted by external particles. So you can use it to study what is happening outside of the Earth. I do plan to continue looking into this field in the future and maybe make some more similar content. Especially if you find this interesting. Just let me know. But until then, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.